Now, what are some of the research methods that will be helpful to planting a church? Well, there are many different types of information we might gather. And depending on what that information is, we would uh, look in different places for it. Now, one of the most basic types of information is what we call demographic information. Basically, that is just a description of the people. And there can be all kinds of elements to that. The age structure, so how many people are there under the age of 18? How many people are there above age 65? Is this an aging population? Is it a younger population? How is that going to be helpful? Well, I know that if there's a lot of young people, maybe youth ministry or children's work would be a good point to begin to connect with this population. If it's a lot of older people, maybe work among senior citizens would be a place to begin. And so knowing about the people, what is their religion? What is their religious affiliation? What do I need to know about their participation? Maybe they claim to be of a certain religion, but they really don't practice it. Or maybe they do practice it and they're very strong. What are their beliefs? What do I need to know? What are some of the factors about just the nature of that people that is going to be important for me? What is their educational level? Are they literate? Do they read and write? Many people are what we call functionally illiterate. In other words, technically, yes, they can read, but their reading is so slow and so weak that their level of understanding is, is virtually nil. And so for practical purposes, they're functionally illiterate. So I need to know that. On the other hand, they may be very well educated. That would make a difference also. How do I evangelize? What kind of arguments might they have against Christianity? Even what vocabulary I use? Can I use a sophisticated language? Will people be turned off if I quote Tolstoy or Plato, will they think, oh, that person's a snob? Or will they think, huh, that person's educated. He speaks a language I can understand. See, that makes a big difference, doesn't it? I need to know those kinds of things. Demographic information also tells us about the mobility of people. In other words, are people moving into this community, moving out a lot? Sometimes you look at a community and there's a lot of students that live there. They're, they're moving in, they're moving out. Um, what's the economic, the income level of the people? All these kinds of information just help me understand the situation. And so I know what you're thinking right now. You're saying, that'd be great to know all that. Where do I find it out? Well, if you live in some places like Germany, it's all at your fingertips. You literally can go online and you can just log into the government city web page, whatever, and there's usually a whole section of data there on demographics, and sometimes you can get very, very detailed information and charts and graphs about the growth of the city and where people came from and where they're going, and you can, all this information is really right there at your fingertips. And so the Germans are masters at collecting all this detailed information. They do all the work for you. All you have to do is ask the right questions and you can get it. And sometimes you can actually go visit these offices and you say, well, you know, I was looking on the web. I didn't find just what I was looking for. And you go in and you're friendly and polite and you ask an intelligent question. And there's a bureaucrat sitting behind a table who does nothing but statistics all day long. And nobody ever comes to talk to him about his statistics. And you come and you ask that intelligent question and you just made his day because you care about what he does, right? And so he's very happy to go, oh, somebody's finally interested in what I do. He goes, and ch -ch -ch -ch. he goes into his computer, and sure enough, he gives you the information you want. That's the ideal. So now, most of you probably don't live or work in a place like that. In fact, in many countries, they are very, very private about this kind of data. They don't want everybody just to be able to go in and access all this kind of data. Sometimes it's sensitive. They don't want the world to know what their literacy rate really is. They don't want the world to know really what their income levels are or their educational levels and so on and so forth. And so the government will not make that information readily accessible to you. So think for a moment, where else could you get some of this information? Sometimes the government does provide information, but it's not reliable. They want to present their city, their state, 
in the most favorable light. Sometimes you can go to the commerce, the Board of Commerce, or there's some sort of a business bureau. They often have this kind of information. They're trying to attract businesses to come and invest in the community. Again, you always have to ask, what's the source of this information? And are they trying to put a spin on it for a reason? See, if I go to the Board of Commerce, they want to attract business. So they're going to try and present data that makes the community look attractive to businesses. Sometimes there's a dominant religion and they don't want to really admit or they don't want their own people to know how many Christians live in that country. They'd rather keep that number small so they can continue to say, look, we are a Muslim country or we are a Hindu country. And so the numbers of Christians or other religions are kept deceptively small. And so there's very often a bias behind the information you get, and you have to make certain judgments. You can read newspapers. Uh, sometimes the current reports that are coming in the newspapers, for example, you may want to know what sections of the city are growing. We found out, for example, in Munich that there was a northern part of the city where there had been a military base. The military base was being closed, and there were plans to build hundreds, I think there were a couple thousand living units of, of, of uh, apartment buildings that were going to be built where that military base was. Now, I was going to take a few years for that to develop, but that's good to know because typically new communities like that are more open to spiritual change and you can get in on the ground floor, so to speak, launch a church in that community and reach new people. So sometimes you'll find those kinds of reports in the newspapers. Um, if you are in a place, if you're working where there is um, openness to do this kind of thing, you can actually do community surveys. Now, surveying is a whole science in itself, and so we can't go into the details of that, but sometimes literally just to going on the streets and talking to people, you can find out a lot. Uh, knocking on doors. Again, if you're in a community where that's the po something possible to do, we sometimes, we would have a team of seminary students come and we'd have them going literally door to door in the community asking people questions uh, about um, all kinds of things, like what are some of the needs in this community? How could a church possibly meet needs in this community? What would cause you to want to attend a church service? Well, those are helpful things to know. And what we would actually do is we would put a letter, we'd send out a letter, we'd have a particular neighborhood, you know, you only have so many people you can ask, so we'd choose particular neighborhoods. We'd put letters in the mailboxes saying, um, you know, on next Wednesday, Thursday, or sometime next week, there will be a student knocking at your door and he's going to ask you some questions and this is why. And so you kind of forewarn the people what's coming so they're not just surprised by some stranger at the door. Sometimes people don't want to open their door to a stranger. And that helped people understand what we were doing. We promised to give them the results. In fact, I promised to give other churches in the area the results also. Creates a little goodwill. So anyway, you may do some surveying like that. Some people do telephone surveying. But you need to try and find out what are the needs of this community? What are the people like? Another thing you can do is literally just uh, go through the community on your car, or on a bicycle, or on foot, and look at how, where are the religious institutions? Are there churches here? Are there temples or synagogues or, or um, other buildings, uh, mosques, that can tell you something about the religious life of the community? You may not find that on the internet anywhere. You talk to other religious leaders. Sometimes even just looking in the phone book, you can find out about what is available in the community. Go to the local library. Many times the local library will have materials about the people who live there, articles, or um, uh, there may be the history. Uh, it's always good to know something about the history of the city or the community where you're going to work, to get a little bit of feel for their background and their experiences. And so these are all different kinds of uh, methods you can use to find out what the people are like, what their interests are, some people will say, well, what, 
find out what radio stations they listen to, what kind of music they even like, um, what kind of movies they like to see. Uh, just helps you get in touch with the people. I once had a professor who told me um, every pastor should, should go and read the bestseller novels, the paperback novels that everybody's reading. It just gets you in touch with what people are listening to, what people are thinking. Um, go see the Hollywood movies that everybody is going to see. So you just know what people are receiving on information. All right. Well, there's just um, a, a lot that could be said about gathering this type of information. So there's demographic information, religious information, beliefs and values, behaviors, felt needs, even social structures. You know, one of the things that Germans like to do is on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, they like to go to a beer garden and just take their time and spend a couple hours just being with other people. Now, whether you drink beer or not, I'll let you decide that. But just spending time with people. When they work, they work hard, but then they spend time with one another just relaxing. And, um, uh, or we found out, for example, uh, when we went to Ingolstadt, we found out that there were all these sport clubs. And uh, in fact, one third of the population, one out of three people who lived in this city were a member of some kind of a sporting club. And uh, now they weren't all necessarily active in you know, doing their sport, but they were members at least. And this, so this was a major social feature of this city. So guess what we decided? You wanna meet people? Join a sporting club. And that's what we did. So I took m up my old college sport of fencing <laughs> and uh, joined a sporting club. Got to meet a lot of people. In fact, they welcomed me into their circle of friends uh, more quickly than I had even imagined. So you find ways. Where are people socializing? Where are those points where I can build relationships and I can get into this community and become a part of it and not just sort of be an outsider? So um, now there's quantitative and qualitative research. The quantitative would be sort of the numbers, the population, the population growth, age structures, these kinds of things. The qualitative is more what do people believe, what motivates them, what are their worries and concerns. And identifying those helps us understand people. Now all of this, see, I like to say this, if, if you love somebody, you want to understand them, right? So all you young lovers, remember how you used to just look into the eyes of your partner and you'd tell me what you're thinking, tell me your story, and how exciting that was just to find out about that person because you cared about them, right? You want to know everything about them and uh, you wanted to hopefully be able to meet their needs as a partner. Um, and when we enter a community, if we love the people, we want to know about them. We want to care about them. It's not just a matter of sort of coming in and sort of dropping the gospel on them. It's a matter of caring for people, and so we want to understand them. It's not about manipulating. Some people say, ah, I see what you're doing. This is going to end up being marketing. You're just marketing the gospel. You're marketing the church. You're just finding out what people want and sort of selling it to them. That's not at all what we're talking about. We're just talking about loving people, caring about people, finding what their hurts are, finding what their dreams are, and finding ways to connect the gospel with where they're at and to structure the church in a way that's relevant to them. Community surveys, we mentioned this, another way of collecting uh, information. Again, some places in the world are going to be restricted. You're not going to be allowed to do this kind of thing. That would create all kinds of problems and suspicions. These are things you have to know what's realistic. Um, and then the various information sources, whether it's internet, the newspapers, the local libraries, the business leaders, the community leaders. Go and talk to the mayor. Go and talk to a social worker and ask them what is going on in our communities here? Where are the needs? And what are the concerns? How could a church possibly speak to some of these needs? How can we demonstrate love to people in a way that they will understand it. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world 
depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. And then we discern the opportunities. So what are the opportunities in this community? I, I, this is all in sort of in the planning phase now. We're just sort of getting to know the community. And so what are the opportunities for the gospel and for a church in this community? Uh, let me give you a quick list and then we'll have an example. Here are some questions you can ask and uh, how you can sort of make those connections, how this can be relevant. What are the unique needs of this community? Maybe there's a special problem with youth crime. And that's a unique need where maybe a youth ministry could address that somehow. What arena of our community is furthest from the utopia God wants to restore? You know, we think of the kingdom of God and peace and reconciliation and righteousness. As I look in the community, where do I see them most distant from God's ideal for them? How can we possibly maybe speak into that? What special opportunities are within our immediate sphere of influence? You know, there's some things we're not going to be able to change as Christians or as a church. They're just too big. But there are maybe some other things we can change. We can take small steps, and they're within our sphere of influence. What are the most significant recent changes in the community? Because usually where there's change, sometimes people are uncertain, and sometimes people need to reorient. It means that the community is moving maybe in a different direction in some way, whether that's educationally, whether it's economically, transportation issues. How do we respond to change? What is the spiritual climate of the community? Are people seeking? Are they very committed to their present religious convictions? How does the history of the community impact people's attitudes and lifestyle? You know, just think as an example here, I think of Eastern Germany and the people there had been sold National Socialism under Hitler, that was going to be the utopia, which was a catastrophic failure. Then they had been sold socialist communist doctrine for another 40 years. That disappointed. That collapsed. Then the free market capitalists said, yes, we're going to bring utopia. You're going to have the great life. You're going to have the good life like we all have in the West, right? Well. Those promises didn't pan out very much either. Ideology failure, ideology failure, ideology failure. People get a little discouraged after that. They get a little cynical. Oh, and then the Christians come along. Well, wait a minute, we've got a message for you now, and this is going to make your life better. Thanks, but no thanks. We've had enough new ideologies. Just, just leave me in peace. Just, just give me a job. The history can make a big difference, can't it, in people's mentalities and their concerns. And I have to be sensitive to that. I have to be sensitive the way they receive me. What are the rhythms of the community? I mentioned about Germans, I can take those long afternoons in the beer garden or just, just taking long walks. Their leisure is leisure. Their work is work. Germans are known to be hard workers, right? Very efficient, hard workers. They work when they work. Leisure is leisure. Some cultures have their leisure at their work <laughs> and their work at their leisure. And, um, you know, do people get up early and, and move around? Or Sunday is a day where everybody just sleeps long. Maybe Sunday morning early is not the best time for a worship service. There's nothing sacred about that time. Maybe Sunday afternoon or evening or some other time. What are the life rhythms? How do you connect with those rhythms? Well, those are all questions that you can take with you. And, and these are great questions as, sort of, as your team is sort of thinking through. How can we reach this community? What, what do we need to do as a church to serve this community and show the gospel and word and deed? Work through some of these kinds of questions. 